Hey everyone, this is the lecture for next Tuesday's course um, and I'm going to be talking in this video about transformers. So if you look at deep learning historically, and by historically I mean more than a few years ago, when you looked across different areas in which neural networks were applied, um, very different methods were used. And so in computer vision, uh, people use convolutional neural networks. Uh, ResNet was state-of-the-art. In natural language processing, uh, recurrent neural networks and LSTMs in particular were used. Um, in speech, I don't have a lot of knowledge about this, but to my understanding and from this picture, I think people weren't even really using deep learning. Um, in translation, there was seek-to-seek, -seek, which we saw last class, um, and um, reinforcement learning also had its own very distinct methods. All right, so this is a few years ago. Um, now flash forward to today, um, and you see the same architecture used across vision, natural language processing, uh, speech, translation, reinforcement learning, graphs, um, you name it. Um, everybody is using essentially this architecture. Um, that's depicted here. So what is this? Um, well, this is the transformer. And um, obviously, if you want to do deep learning, um, given this state of the art, um, you need to understand what the transformer is. And so today we're going to be talking about the original transformer uh, paper, uh, Attention is All You Need. And then we'll spend um, some time talking about transformer large language models. Um, and then we'll talk about vision transformers and even audio transformer, which is actually very similar to the vision transformer. Um, and I mean, it's just, um, <laughs> you have to take a second to stop and think kind of like how remarkable that this is, that you would have kind of this um, state of the world and then move to this architecture being so dominant across um, all different types of unstructured data that you might want to process. All right, so let's start with an overview. Um, so as I said, the figures you saw is the transformer. Um, the transformer um, in its original form is a seek-to-seek -seek model that's based entirely on attention. Um, the title of the paper is Attention is All You Need. So this paper began by being enormously influential in NLP, sometimes referred to as the ImageNet or AlexNet moment of NLP. Um, and while the original transformer is about machine translation, uh, we'll see subsequently that it can form the basis for many NLP um, models. One advantage of being such an influential paper is that there are many efforts to explain it, um, and some of them are really, really good. Um, so I'm going to use visualizations today um, from the Illustrated Transformer by Jay Alomar. Um, you know, it's not a crazy thing to do to just go to that blog post and also read it carefully, um, you know, along with, in addition to um, this lecture, um, you know, so very much, you know, I'm going to be presenting this. Um, I feel like this is not an area where I have a huge amount to add um, because there's been lots of great, um, lots of great presentations of the transformer. Um, but obviously we need to cover this and we need to understand what this is um, so we can go on to talk about lots and lots of interesting applications of this to uh, data that economists might want to use. Um, all right. So remember that we talked about attention um, last class. Um, if you feel like you don't have a complete grip on what that was, please go back and, you know, briefly watch those few minutes um, of that video. Um, because as I said, <laughs> the transformer is attention is all you need. And so attention is um, a central ingredient. 
And the paper made several powerful modifications to attention. Um, so self-attention, multi-headed attention, uh, positional encodings, and normalized dot product attention. And so we're gonna talk about each of these concepts and why they're important in turn. All right, so let me give a very high level overview. The transformer was developed, as I said, for machine translation, and so it has an encoder and a decoder component, just like we saw um, in the um, pre-transformer models of machine translation um, from uh, class last week. Importantly, having an encoder and a decoder is not essential to the transformer architecture, and we're going to see subsequently that many of the most powerful applications of the transformer architecture use only the encoder or only the decoder blocks. Um, and so this very much goes back to a theme of the course, which is that neural networks are like Legos and they can be stacked in various ways, um, sub subject to solving the vanishing gradient problem. Um, and this is one of the most powerful ideas in deep learning. All right, so the encoder and the decoder each sat stack six transformer blocks and we'll Obviously, we're going to be going into detail in a minute about what a transformer block is. Um, and so there's nothing inherent. You know, you might say, well, why, why six? Um, it doesn't have to be six. It just was in the original paper. They had to choose something. Um, but we'll see, you know, next class, an example um, of an architecture, which is from model GPT-3, uh, that stacks 96 transformer blocks. Um, this model has 175 billion parameters um, and costs about $4.6 million to train. And so, you know, you can stack more and more and it's like, I mean, that's, <laughs> um, you know, we'll see that that's central to the success of this model that is very scalable. So, you know, you could stack however many of these blocks subject to the cost of training that model and whether or not you actually needed that many blocks. All right, so that um, encoder and decoder layers differ in important ways um, that we'll discuss. Um, and, you know, again, even though machine translation is not our primary application, it's important to understand these differences because next class we're gonna see encoder language models on in decoder language models, you know, so for example, uh, GPT chat based on GPT-3 would be a decoder language model. Um, BERT, another one you've probably heard of, um, would be an encoder language model. Um, so each of the six encoder layers have the same structure and they do not share weights. And so they have a self-attention layer and a feed-forward layer. And so we start with a sequence of words um, or tokens, uh, which as we talked about last class, you can think about tokens as words, although sometimes uh, they're, they're subwords. Um, and those are fed into the transformer at the same time. And so this is already looking pretty different uh, than what we saw on Thursday with the RNN, where the inputs were fed in sequentially. With the transformer, you're feeding in your sequence of text, so in this case, the sentence that you want to translate, perhaps, um, at the same time. And um, there's going to be dependencies in the self-attention layer, you know, and as we'll see in a minute, this is the whole point of self-attention. All right. And so, the parallel aspect of this, in other words, that you're feeding in the sequence together, is going to be central to the success of the model, kind of even leaving aside the self-attention. It makes it possible to compute things much faster and hence train a much larger model than architectures like an RNN that are computed sequentially. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the decoder blocks also have a self-attention layer and a feed-forward layer, but they include an additional attention layer that attends to the final encoder layer. And so this is analogous to attention and seek-to-seek -seek that we saw earlier. Um, 
Self-attention also is going to work differently in the encoder versus in the decoder. Um, and as I said, this is going to be relevant subsequently when we see that some language models stack decoder blocks and other stack encoder blocks. All right. Um, so previously, attention allowed each step of the decoder to attend to different portions of the encoder. When we saw kind of the original concept of attention in neural translation last lecture. Um, a key insight of the transformer is that we also want a sentence or a sequence of words to be able to attend to different portions of itself while being embedded. Um, so you don't want, you know, just the decoder to attend to the encoder. You want the sequence that you're feeding into the encoder to be able to attend to itself. Um, and so to use an example from the paper, um, the animal didn't cross the road because it was too tired versus the animal didn't cross the road because it was too wide. So we want to know, does it refer to animal or road? And this is going to be relevant when translating to a language that has gendered pronouns. So the transformer gets this right, whereas previous models did not typically get this right. Um, and you can see this in the self-attention distribution. So remember last class when we introduced the idea of an attention, there's an attention distribution. Um, in creating a representation for it, what other tokens are being attended to. You can visualize those distributions and you can see when um, it is referring to animal, it's learned kind of to attend to that. And when it is referring to street, it's learned to attend to that. Um, so in a recurrent neural network, the hidden states um, allows it to incorporate past representations into the current representation. Um, and um, there's not this kind of history variable that you pass along sequentially the way that there is in an RNN um, in the transformer, because remember you're feeding everything in in parallel. Instead, self-attention is going to serve this role. Um, and it's going to do it in a way that allows, for example, for much longer range dependencies, right? By construction in a recurrent neural network where you're passing along this history at each time step, it's going to tend to emphasize the immediately preceding you know, uh, time steps, the immediately preceding tokens. Um, Whereas this is a, going to allow um, for capturing long range dependencies, which remember, as we talked about again last lecture, are really a uh, fundamental component of human language. Okay, so the results of the transformer are really impressive. Um, this is on blue, remember, which is like one of the main benchmarks. It's really blowing these other models out of the water. Um, same on English French translation quality. All right, um, so now I want to talk about the encoder um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so I'll talk about encoder self attention, about positional encodings, and about adding and normalization. Okay. And so, um, as in the previous um, model that um, that we've seen last class, the initial inputs of the transformer are word vectors from a lookup table, um, and they are fed into the model at the same time versus sequentially. Again, just to re-emphasize that. Um, so the first step to calculating self-attention is to compute three vectors. There's going to be a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. Um, and these are calculated by multiplying the embeddings that are fed into the model. Um, and so the vector representations of the, the words, um, by multiplying those em embeddings by three different matrices. Um, and note that these vectors are going to be smaller. So the input embeddings um, in a transformer language model are often of dimension 512. They don't have to be. In larger models, they can be larger. In like lightweight models, they can be smaller, but let's say they're 512. 
Um, and these vectors are going to be smaller. And as we'll see, the transformer is going to have multiple attention heads, um, and we want them to be smaller for computational purposes. All right, so you see we have an input thinking machines, um, and we have um, an embedding um, of those tokens. Um, and then we're going to have these three matrices, which are learned parameters, um, uh, the query, the key, and the value. And we multiply those um, by x1 and x2 to get the query value, the queries, uh, the query vectors, key vectors, and value vectors. All right. And so just as with regular attention that we saw last class, we're going to use the query and the key to compute the attention score. And so we just take the dot product between the query and the key. Um, and for a given word, we use the query to compute attention to all different words in the input. Um, and um, so um, you can take the dot product with you know, itself um, and with all the other words um, in the inputs. All right, and as I said, we compute the attention score by taking the dot product between the query and the key for each word in the sequence that that query can attend to. Okay, we're next going to divide the scores by the square root of the key vector dimensionality, um, which in the original transformer paper is eight. So you might say, well, like, what is that? <laughs> um, and this just helps to produce more stable gradients. Um, and so essentially it's like, um, uh, just a trick to make the gradients more stable. All right, then we're going to take the softmax. So as we might expect in this example, um, the word at the position under consideration has the highest score, um, but other words might also be attended to. So it's attending most to itself, but it can also attend to um, the other words in the sequence to varying uh, learn degrees. Um, so next we multiply the softmax scores times the value vector uh, for each position. This will preserve the values of words we want to focus on, and it's going to send the values of other words to zero by multiplying them by a small number, which is the softmax output. Um, from uh, the attention score. And finally, we add up the weighted value vectors. Okay, so again, you know, we're using this to um, be able to take information from um, all the tokens in the input, um, which we couldn't just concatenate them. It would be a variably sized vector, but instead we allow for self-attention and that essentially means we're able to take kind of um, a, weighted, a weighted sum of these. And this produces the output of self-attention for that position, which we're, you know, we're going to call Z. Um, all right, so let's take a simplified example where we're only feeding in two words, um, which we have in that kind of X. Um, X is our, our inputs, our tokenized words. And to get the query, we multiply x by the query um, uh, matrix. Um, and to get the key, we multiply that by the wk. Um, and to um, get the value, we multiply it by um, the weight matrix for the value. And again, all these weights are learnable parameters. So now we have our query and our key and our value. Um, so we just compute those by matrix multiplication. Um, and then we calculate the attention scores, which is just um, taking the dot product between um, the query um, and the key and normalizing that and then multiplying that by the value um, or multiplying the softmax of that by the value vector um, and adding those all up. And we get Z from that, which is our, uh, our attention output. And so we kind of start with this representation of a word, um, and then we're going to get out an output that is going to be um, attending, kind of taking information um, from 
the parts of the sentence that it's learned is most relevant. You know, so in the case of uh, the example I gave, you know, the animal crossed the road because it, you know, if it's the pronoun attends to animal, it's going to take information from that representation of animal. And then that's going to be very useful when it needs to decide kind of the gendered pronoun um, that it's translated into. Okay, so the original transformer uses eight attention heads, and this allows for multiple representation subspaces, which leads to better results. And so, you know, one attention head can mostly pay attention to itself, another can pay attention to the noun that the pronoun refers to, etc. Okay, um, and so you just see that kind of illustrated here that you have this input, and then you're going to have these different attention heads. And again, these, these weight matrices, these are learned parameters, and it's gonna be able to learn to attend to different things um, with the different heads. So this is going to yield eight different output vectors Z, um, you know, from the input of this sequence. So recall that these representations are different dimensionality. Um, so they're going to be 64 instead of 512, which is the dimensionality of the tokenized inputs. And so we can condense this into a single vector for each input of size 512 by multiplying by yet another matrix, uh, which is this W uh, O. And so to put it all together, um, we have an input sentence um, thinking machines um, at um, you know the the first layer, um, and then uh, we're going to embed each word, um, and then split this into eight um, heads, um, and we multiply um, the x um, by the, each of the weight matrices for the query, the key, and the value. Um, and then uh, we calculate attention using the resulting um, matrices and we concatenate the results um, from uh, the attention um, calculations. Um, and then we multiply it with another weight matrix to produce the output layer. Okay, and then that output layer, we're gonna do some other things and then it's gonna subsequently be R which is the input layer for the next layer of the transformer. Because remember we were stacking what, like eight, you know, as many as 92 in the case of GPT-3 of these blocks. So this is how we get these self-attention distributions um, that I showed, uh, that I showed before. Um, there's also some other aspects of the encoder architecture that are worth mentioning. Um, so in an RNN where we feed and input words one at a time, the model, like by virtue of this, has a way to keep track of the word ordering, right? Because you're feeding the words in in the order that they appear. Um, and this is important. For example, a word is more likely to need to attend to a word that is closer. Um, and it's missing from the description of the transformer that I've given you thus far because um, we're feeding all tokens in at the same time. Um, so the model's going to address this by adding a vector to each input that captures the position, which is called the positional embedding. Um, and these follow a specific pattern, which the model can learn in order to be able to incorporate positional information. Um, and so you see that represented here. You have um, your input sentence, um, and you tokenize that text, and you add a positional embedding. Um, to get an embedding that has a time signal in it, which is what is actually fed in to the encoder block. Um, so here's an example um, for a three-word input. Um, and so you're taking the embeddings of each word um, and adding to them positional encodings. So this is a plot from the transformer to transformer implementation package of what those positional embeddings uh, look like. Um, and here's a plot from a method used in the original paper, uh, which intersperses the sine and cosine signals. All right. Um, another key component of the architecture is the residual connections. Um, 
And um, so we've seen residual connections before, right? Um, and so when you get that, um, when you get that um, output from the self-attention layer, you're actually adding it to the input. Um, and um, so you're learning a residual, um, just as we saw with ResNet. And we know that that's important to solving the vanishing gradient problem. Um, and we need that in order to be able to stack, you know, in the case of GPT, 92 of these blocks on top of each other, which is just insane. Um, and um, then there's also going to be uh, normalization. All right, so this is um, a visualization of what this looks like. And so you take your um, input words, thinking machines, and you tokenize those, and you add a positional encoding. And those are the inputs to the self-attention layer. Um, and then for each of those, um, you have your um, query and your value and you, your key um, and the multiple, kind of the multiple attention heads, um, and you get the outputs. Um, which are now a more contextualized representation of each word. Um, so it's um, you know, your original input plus what it is attended to. Um, and then you're going to have a normalization um, of the um, sum between your input x and z, because you're learning a residual. Um, and then that gives you your output, and you're going to pass those to a feed forward layer, um, and then do um, another um, addition and normalization. All right, so that is the encoder. Um, now I want to talk briefly about the decoder blocks. So in many ways, the decoder is similar to the encoder. It adds an additional block to each transformer called encoder decoder attention. Um, and so that's the first difference. Um, and the second difference is that the self-attention blocks are somewhat different than they are in the encoder. So encoder decoder attention allows the decoder to attend to the hidden states from the last layer of the encoder. Um, this is much, you know, as we saw with um, seek to seek uh, last lecture. So specifically key and value outputs from the top encoder. Um, so kind of the last encoder that um, uh, that information is fed to are used by each encoder decoder attention block to help the decoder focus on appropriate positions in the input sequence. Okay. And so it's attending as it's, you know, um, sequentially um, predicting uh, the translation. Um, and so this is going to continue sequentially until the end token is reached. Um, and this is just very analogous to how attention worked in a uh, vanilla seek to seek model that we saw last class. Okay, the other thing is that self-attention is different in the decoder. So in the encoder self-attention blocks, a position can see tokens from the right. Um, and so this is not going to be the case for the decoder blocks, um, right? Because the idea here is akin to predicting the next word given the previous context, right? So the um, decoder blocks are a language model um, that are decoding, they're predicting the next word. Um, and so obviously when you're training <laughs> this model, you don't want it to see um, the words to the right because the point is that it needs to predict them. All right. Um, and so this is just called mask self-attention. Um, and it's you know, essentially analogous to attention in the encoder blocks, except you're not allowed to attend um, to the tokens um, that come to the right, that come after, um, because the whole point of the decoder is to be trained to predict what the next token is. Um, and so consider a sentence that has uh, four words, uh, robot must obey orders. Um, all right, so calculate the attention scores by multiplying the query matrix by the key matrix, um, just like we did um, in, um, in the encoder layers. 
Um, and after creating the scores, multiply by an attention mask. Um, that's just going to be effectively a triangle, right? Where now you cannot see, you cannot attend to um, the, the words that come after in the sequence. Um, then apply softmax. All right. And besides that, it's um, analogous to self-attention in the encoder. All right, um, so um, now, um, how do we turn the vector outputs from the decoder into a word? Um, there's a linear layer, which is just a vanilla fully connected neural network. This is just like we saw when we were talking about kind of AlexNet or really analogous to the kind of the vanilla fully connected network that were in those introductory videos by Grant Sanderson. Um, and that's going to project the vector produced by the decoder stack into a much larger vector called the logits vector. Um, so if our vocabulary has 10,000 words, the logits vector would have a dimensionality 10,000 with each value corresponding to the score of a unique word. And softmax turns these scores into numbers between zero and one, and the cell with the highest value is chosen um, if doing greedy decoding or kind of in reality, um, you'd probably do beam search and keep track of more than one possibility um, like we discussed uh, last lecture. All right. Um, so finally, I wanna say a word about training. Um, so the training objective is just a cross entropy loss. Um, and um, so, um, you know, we know from the training data, um, which word comes next. Um, and then from those logit vectors, you get um, the, um, the scores, and we just have a standard cross entropy loss like we saw last or class or maybe two classes ago. Um, so I want to make a few important notes. Um, so at inference time, um, which is you know when you're using this model to predict what word comes next on data, the transformer is autoregressive. Um, and this is gonna potentially matter um, for some applications. And so for example, when we get to OCR, um, we'll see a transformer um, encoder decoder OCR model. Um, and it's pretty slow to run at inference time because it has to do this autoregressive prediction. I mean, it's also, there's other reasons for it being slow, like it being large and these other things, but um, it has um, autoregressive prediction. Um, whereas we'll discuss kind of another way of doing OCR where you don't, it's not sequence to sequence. You don't have that autoregressive nature. And so that's just um, faster because you can parallelize it. Um, however, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, really part of the what's remarkable about the transformer and what has allowed it to become so widespread across so many domains is it really scales well with training. Um, and um, it scales well because it's not auto-regressive at training time. Um, and so why is that? Uh, well, in training, um, so remember kind of the decoder um, is, um, let me come back up here to the picture. And so when it's decoding, it's taking the previous um, outputs as inputs to the decoder to predict what's next. Um, and so um, you might say, well, how can this not be autoregressive? And the thing is that when you're training like, okay, so step back. Obviously, when you're doing inference, like you're feeding this new text and you want to predict the word that comes next, um, uh, you don't know <laughs> the ground truth. Like um, you're, you're giving an input and you want it to, to, to complete the sentence, like you're using a chatbot or something, or you're translating something. You don't know um, the ground truth. And so this has to be conditioned on the previous outputs, right? So it has to be autoregressive. If I'm translating a sentence, the model doesn't know what the ground truth is. Um, and so it's, you know, having to use the previous outputs to do this, right? And so it's autoregressive. But when you're training the model, you know the ground truth, right? You're training it on ground truth data. 
um, and you don't use the predicted token, you use the ground truth token, right? And you know that already. Um, and so it doesn't need to be auto regressive. Um, it can all be trained in parallel and that makes for much, much faster training than if you had to train it auto regressively. Um, and you know, remember when, when we saw kind of seek to seek, we were also using the ground truth tokens um, to train it, which is something that you'll see sometimes referred to as teacher forcing. Um, but we had to train it sequentially because you have this hidden state, this history that you're passing along at each time step, right? And so an LSTM model would have to be trained, um, you know, auto regressively. Um, and that's just a much, much slower process. And so really um, the massive processing power of GPUs is unleashed when you're doing large, large numbers of parallel calculations. Um, and so the transformer is really an architecture that's also made for the way that the hardware works, the way that our compute power works. It can really um, capture that massive parallel computing power of GPUs in a way that um, LSTMs couldn't leverage. And of course, like um, LSTMs, like that paper was from like 1997 or something before there were, right, um, before there were um, GPU, like powerful GPUs. Um, all right. Um, so as I said, at inference time, um, you can't do this, although it does um, cache the hidden states of the previous time step, so at least those aren't recomputed at each step. Um, but this is really important because, you know, as we will see next class with large language models, one of the kind of most striking and remarkable findings is that language models have tended to do better and better as they get bigger and bigger. I think people their kind of ex ante um, thought would have been that you would get to kind of steeply decreasing returns long before you hit the 175 billion parameters of GPT-3. Um, but that's actually kind of not the case to really realistically generate human-like language and, um, you know, to be able to have good performance of, you know, something like what, what chat GPT tries to, to, to do. Um, you know, having that really large model like you do with GPT-3 is, you know, has, has huge returns. And the only way you can possibly like, you know, um, estimate a model with 175 billion parameters is if you have a very, very, very efficient way to train that model. And transformers are very, very efficient to train because it can be trained in parallel and really exploit the parallel processing of GPUs. All right, um, so that's all I have on the transformer and I'll really look forward to discussing this more on class Tuesday. Thank you.